again. Last week, here I gave out what I believe to be one of the most significant items of what we call stuff in number 114 that you have. The material is from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and it's titled The Green Party. There are several significant statements in NASA's Green Party material. If you have it with you, one under the headline it says, Ben the Green Power, it says, Plants, man, let me read it myself and say exactly, but it says, Power from Plants have changed the world. Now, I, you know, it was a long time ago I told you to put a green light at your house. And, it, you know, I understand these things seem kind of irrelevant because you've been experiencing years and years of religion, which, you know, basically is, is kind of irrelevant. Nothing ever happens. But I said, you know, consider that. Powerful plants have changed the world is what it says there. And in the very uh, first paragraph, it says, scientists are shedding light on the biggest power booster on our planet. And what NASA is saying is that the biggest power booster on our planet is light from above that touches chlorophyll in the hemoglobin, chlorophyll in plants, hemoglobin in human beings, green light. Okay? We, learned, we learned from this material that we had er, given out earlier that Chlorophyll converts light energy into something called ATP. It's a large um, scientific name. But we won't get into that. But ATP is in both plants and human beings. Actually, it is the hemoglobin in humans, which is complementary to chlorophyll in plants. ATP is the source of energy for living cells in plants and in humans and in animals. And ATP is a direct result of light from above interacting with either chlorophyll or hemoglobin, interacting with green. So it's green light, which is actually responsible for ATP. And ATP is the immediate source of energy for muscle contraction. In other words, you couldn't move unless there's ATP, and there's no ATP unless there's green light, light interacting with the green of the earth. So the HEMA group in humans is related to the chlorophyll in plants, and through light touching both, there is the source of energy for all life. And that, that's what's very interesting. But something important that we have to go over again is on page 114 of this material. It's in paragraph 3. And it's talking about green light. It says, this provides the plant food in the form of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, the building blocks of life. And now for today, what I want you to do is keep in mind this article. And that nucleic acid is DNA. Green light, DNA. Who said there's a connection? The National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Very, very important. Keep in mind that because it's going to be important, very important later as we, we get into this. On page 114B, talking again about green light in paragraph 1, it says, without, this is the last line of paragraph 1, Without the photosystem, now the photosystem is NASA's term for the green light. Without the photosystem, molecules, life as we know it, would cease to exist. So how important is green light? Without it, there's none of anybody. Okay. Now again, very important for where we're going. On page 114C, the last paragraph, just as in human cells, the photosystem proteins, that's the green light, inside a plant cell are translated from amino acids. These amino acids are in turn translated from the complex array of nucleic acids in DNA. The description of the molecular code reads like an encrypted message. 
Okay? Now, what's interesting about that is the nucleic acid is the product of green light. The green light is an angle of light. It's a photon, which the Bible says is an angel of light. The angle of light as a photon is a messenger particle. The angel in the Bible is a messenger. And so here now we find that there's a direct connection between the angle of light or the messenger and an encrypted message called DNA. There's a direct connection. NASA has given us a direct connection. In other words, there could be no DNA unless there's light interacting with HEMA and uh, chlorophyll. There can be no DNA unless there's um, uh, an angle of light, and the angle of light is the messenger, and we find out that the DNA is an encrypted message. And that's what it says in your article from NASA in the very last line. A description of the molecular code reads like an encrypted message message. So you see how everything is conveyed in symbols. Even you, it's an encrypted, you're an encrypted, there's a coded message inside of you. Not a plane, there's nothing written on your head or anything. It's all written in cosmic code, really. And so not only inside of you is there a, an encrypted message that we call DNA, Jesus never spoke but in a symbol, that's what the Bible says. The Bible is allegorical, that's what the Bible says. The myths and the ancient stories. And NASA tells us there's an intelligent message conveyed to all living things in a molecular code which reads like an encrypted message. Right. Isn't it encrypted? You know what an encrypted message is? It's code. It's like Morse code, you know. And that's, what it, that's, what it, uh, that's what it is. Now, talking again about green and all of this business, let me go over once again the Bible scriptures, and you don't have to. You can take my words in the Bible. Job 8.16, he is green before the sun, and his branch shoots forth in his garden. Job 15.31, let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. Psalm 23, the one that everybody knows. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It's not talking about cow pastures. It's not talking about what you think is a pasture. It's talking about something much more significant. What? Song of Solomon 116, Behold, you are fair, my beloved, yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. Revelation 9, 4, and it was commanded them, that's talking about the angels, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads, which is the pineal gland. There's a book called The Power of Color, and it's written by Dr. Morton Walker, and he speaks of green from a metaphysical uh, perspective. And, and he says about it, emerald green is often the symbol of hope and growth and is used this way in many Christian paintings. To Muslims, green is a sacred color symbolizing immortality. The Buddha is often painted against a green background to denote the permanent life behind all of man's temporary incarnations. And emerald green returns us to the Bible because it says in Revelation 4.2, I was in the spirit, there was a throne, and one was sitting on the throne, and he that sat upon the throne like a jasper, and there was a rainbow about the throne like unto an emerald, green light. And then, of course, I, you have page 112 of the material I gave you a couple of weeks ago. The scientist at NASA who has a flying prototype of a ship that flies by laser. And if you look at page 112, what I'm telling you is not coming from New Age stuff. It comes from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and Space Science News. This ship flies on laser power. And in the fifth paragraph, if you look at page 112 of your stuff, in the fifth paragraph, the scientist says, 
my goal has been to cut the cost of getting to space by a factor of a thousand using a system that is completely green. Now, looking down above you right now from space is Supernova 1987A, which, which you have seen. The center eye of Supernova 1987A is green. And it's on fire now. If you look in the color spectrum, the center of the color spectrum is the color green. Now, I showed you a few weeks ago um, a scientific diagram showing the human eye. And the human eye senses color in three spectrums. And the top one is red, the bottom one is blue, and the center that your eye picks up is green. Kabbalists, those who studied the ancient Kabbalah, stated the pathway to God was the center. And they considered green that pathway because it is the center of the light spectrum. Right now, you're living in the Aquarian Age. And the ruling planet of the Aquarian Age is Uranus. What makes it unusual is that Uranus spins on its side. It doesn't spin up and down. It spins like this, sideways. And so the electromagnetic fields that come from it are chaotic, and they cause the exact chaos that Al was talking about. And Uranus is the green planet. So, I mean, how can all these coincidences exist? They're not coincidences. But, you know, it's like everything else on the Earth. Very few people pay attention to it. So now let's try to fit the puzzle together. You got all this talking about green, 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 green. How in the world does it all work? And does it work? I say meditation. I says, well, you know, like we said, you observe yourself. You watch yourself. And I tell you, well, when you watch yourself, the observation causes the light wave, which is inside the brain, to collapse to a particle, which then puts you into a harmony with the universe and you can receive. How, how is that possible? I mean, that's ridiculous. How could it possibly be? How could you send healing or whatever to somebody else? How could you receive anything from, you know, sitting there listening to some gongs or something, bong, 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 when you're going to harmonize with the universe? How is this possible? I mean, what happens inside of your head how, where would the message come from? Nobody's talking to you. How would you know? So, you know, how could it, prop, how could it even remotely provide enlightenment to people? And to me, if you can't explain it, I don't want to hear it. I think it's stupid. I think, I think all of this stuff that we've done all of our lives, we're going to churches, is absolutely stupid because we don't know what we're there for. We just show up. Because if you don't, the, your parents or your family get mad at you. But you know, nobody knows what they're there for. Everybody sits there and goes through all of these different things. And there's one thing. It's because nobody knows. They say, well, maybe after we die, maybe I'll go to some place and I'll get an apartment or a uh, split level house. There's no reason to be. Because there is no way to logically explain anything. And, 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 and it's the same way here with meditation. If I tell you you collapse the wave, well, we, we, we can prove that because that's quantum physics. But then well, how do you know anything happened? <laughs> how is something good going to happen out of that? Now, it is important as we consider this to recall that in that NASA article that I gave you last week called The Green Party, let's just look one more time because you're going to hear today from an anthropologist by the name of Dr. Jeremy Narby. And what you're going to hear from him is critical as we consider what NASA says. And it's once again, if you look at page 114C, at the bottom of the page. And I read it before, but I'll read it again because it's important. Just as in human cells, the photosystem, that's the green light, proteins, light, green. Let's put that together. Green, light, OK? Inside a plant cell are translated from amino acids. Amino acids have a 20-letter alphabet for each of the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. These acids are in turn translated from the complex array of nucleic acids and DNA codes as the letters A, G, T, C. A description of the molecular code 
reads like an encrypted message. So the message is connected to the green light. Now the only, you know, that, that's not a new age idea. That's coming from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And I think they're competent scientific people to tell us that. So you can, you, you know, I would trust them. I trust no priests, ministers, rabbis, religious people, but you can trust, I believe, the um, NSA. Yes, Debbie? Okay. So that, Debbie said that there's uh, something in the body that uh, is called messenger RNA that trans yeah, translates the code. The okay. The All right. Very good. So, 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 so once again, then it would fit in right with what, what they're talking about here. You know, and, and that would match with what you're saying. So somehow, now I don't know how, Debbie, when she completes all of her studies, can come back and explain it. I don't know. I'll never know how. But somehow, light entering the Earth on an angle, a messenger particle, a photon, angles of light, messenger particle, somehow NASA finds that as this light touches chlorophyll and hemohumans, it sets up a complex activity from amino acids into DNA, and the encrypted intelligent message is given to all living things. An intelligent message. I mean, the cat gets an intelligent message depending on what the cat needs. The elephant gets an encrypted message depending on what the elephant needs. You and I get an encrypted message depending on what we need. So the message comes from angles of light, from green light. Now, there was a document that came out in April, <laughs> the April to July 1999, Science Review, and there was a, a fellow by the name of Dr. Jeremy Narby. And Jeremy Narby is an anthropologist who was baccalaureate, received his laureate degrees and all this from Stanford University. Extremely prestigious, extremely scientific, not given to any hocus pocus or any of this stuff. But anyhow, this is what he says. The spirits one sees in hallucinations are made of their own language like DNA. And then he asks a question, is DNA linked to the cosmic serpents from the round of the world? Now this gets very interesting, and I'll tell you why. It started out in 1984. Dr. Narby was in a place called Kirishari in the Peruvian Amazon Valley, in the middle of the jungle. That's what these anthropologists do, you know. But he was struck by something that changed his whole approach. He was a very, very scientific, pragmatic guy. As he sat around the fire in the middle of the jungle, he sat around with this shaman, bushman, and he was talking to this guy. And this guy said that, most diseases he could cure. He said he, he learned about the medicinal properties of plants by drinking a hallucinogenic brew. So you can see, you know, Narby sitting there listening to this guy. The guy said, yeah, I can, I can heal all this stuff. How, 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 do you, how do you understand all of these things? Oh, I drink this stuff. He claimed he could cure the bite of a deadly snake, but he said one learns these things by drinking ayahuasca, A-Y-A-H-U-A-S-A-C-A. -A -A -A. And Dr. Narby said, when he said that to me, he wasn't smiling. Now, the question that was spinning around in uh, Narby's head was, did the information about all of this healing and understanding the molecular structure of these things, did the information come from the brain as the result of the hallucination? Or was the hallucination actually a message from the plant? In other words, was the DNA from the plant conversing with the DNA in the brain?
Now remember, Dr. Narby has a doctorate in anthropology from Stanford University. It's interesting, isn't it, when you hear this, considering the green light and considering Dr. Narby's work now coming out with saying it could very well be that plants can talk intelligently to human beings through DNA. And you're taking herbs and all of this new stuff to get healed in 1999. Doctors are into all the learning of medicine and giving out all kinds of greens from the earth and herbs and all of these things. I mean, basically, what is getting popular in this very advanced scientific country is the very same stuff that this guy in the middle of the Amazon jungle has been giving out to people for years. But how did he find out about it? healing agencies that actually come from green light. This is what Narby had to deal with. People living in the middle of the Amazon forest insisted that their extensive botanic knowledge of healing came from plant-induced hallucinations. And Narby then took off on his career of saying, how in the world could this possibly be true? Isn't it reminiscent of the question that we talked about of Plato and Pythagoras and all of these guys? How could people thousands of years ago know about quantum physics, electrons, and nuclear energy? Who taught them? And here Dr. Narby asks, how could shamans in the middle of the Amazon jungle know about the molecular properties in plants and the art of combining them? Who told them? Where did they get it from? How is it possible? And see, of course, we, we look at them and say, well, we're the civilized people. We have drugs. They're, you know, bush people. They don't know. But now suddenly we're starting to use the same thing that he was using. Now listen to the science involved here. When you think, people in the middle of the jungle, no schools, no universities, no medicine, no doctors, no nothing, but this guy sitting around a fire said, you know, what do you got? I'll cure you. How, try to consider how these people in the middle of the Amazon jungle could do this. The green plant here is called Ayahuasca, A-Y-A-H-U-A-S-C-A. A-Y-A, I'll have to go back and look at that again. H-U-A-S-C-A, H-U-A-S-C-A. That's what's involved, okay? These people have used the brew for ages. The interesting point, now this is what you got to pay attention to because these are what you would call savages in the middle of the jungle. The interesting point, according to Dr. Narby, is that in order for this thing to work, you must combine two plants which must be boiled together for hours. The first contains a hallucinogenic, uh, what did I say? Hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic substance called, oh my God, D I M E T H Y L, dimethyl tripotene. D, D I M E T H Y L, where am I? T H Y L T R Y P T. A M I N E. Okay? Which seems also, according to Dr. Har uh, Narby, to say this stuff is also secreted by the brain, the human brain. But this hallucinogenic has no effect whatsoever when swallowed because there's a stomach enzyme that blocks it. So it can't work. The second plant that they have to put in and boil with it, however, has substances that inactivate the precise stomach enzyme allowing this hallucinogenic to reach the brain. 
So out of the billions and billions and billions of plants and trees and all of this stuff, somehow they found this and realized that in order for this to work, they had to combine it with this because the stomach enzyme that would stop this is destroyed by this, and so then the hallucinogenic can work. Now they knew that. So with all the billions and billions of green plants, somehow they knew which two that had to be combined to get the desired effect. And this really fascinated Narby. He said, how in God's name could they know that? Somehow out of all the green in the Amazon, they found the plant with a hallucinogenic brain hormone and combined it with a vine that in an inactivated the enzyme of the digestive tract, which would have otherwise blocked the effect. And they do this for the express purpose of modifying or changing their consciousness. So in order for them to get this, to change their consciousness, they knew that they had to combine it with this here. What was the this, Bill? I don't know what the this oh. is. It's another. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So we're talking about the power of green light here. Photosystem 1, as NASA would say, the green party. And is, this is what Narby went on to say. If, it is if they knew the molecular properties of plants and the art of combining them, when one asks them how they know these things, they say that their knowledge comes directly from the plants. The plants tell them. Well, they uh, basically, to do something like that, when you have a direct reason for doing it, and you combine something that accomplishes a, such a thing as deliberately destroying an enzyme that will allow this thing to flow to the brain, you know, there has to be a very, very important and intelligent cause of there, and not a, uh, in any way, shape, or form an accident. That's, that's what Narby gets into. Well, anyhow, a message then is conveyed to them from the green plants. This is what I want you to concentrate on. An intelligent message that comes from the outside to the inside and communicates somehow in a coded way that is decoded by the brain. And I want you to start thinking of this because I want you to start thinking about how meditation works. I want to reach the point of being able to say, this is how it works. If we say that this occurs, this is how it occurs. What is coming from the outside can enter the body, as it does with these people, and when it enters the body, an intelligent conversation takes place between DNA that came in and DNA that's in. And so then a change happens to the body. A change happens to consciousness. A change happens to intelligence. An intelligent message that comes from the outside. So Narvi arrived at an original, initial conclusion, and he put it this way. Their knowledge was undeniable. I'm not, in other words, it wasn't a question of you coming and saying, well, you know, this stuff. The, they're healing people, they're treating diseases by stuff that doctors and hospitals all know nothing about, other than the fact that this really, they do this, and this works. Their knowledge was undeniable, he says, but their explanations concerning the origin of their knowledge was unbelievable to me. That's what he said. My attitude was ambivalent. On the one hand, I wanted to understand what they thought about the reality of spirits. But on the other, I couldn't take seriously what they said because I did not believe it. Not unlike what we were talking about, the ancient Greeks. They have the knowledge... They proved that, but how in the world did they get it? I mean, Democrates had the knowledge about the electrons and how an electron moves out of its orbit inside of an atom, but how did he get that information? Where, where did he get it from? And so then you have these people who are doing this stuff and concocting all... Now, this is just one thing. Concocting all of these different herbs and all of these different things and giving them to people and treating diseases. How did they get this information from? Because in order to do that, they have to know how the body works, and then they have to know the molecular structure of the, of the medicine they're putting together. I mean, they're mixing medicine just like you do in a, the, the drugstore across the street, only they're doing it in the middle of the jungle. It's the same thing, but it's from the earth. How do they know that? 
1992, uh, Dr. Norby, the anthropologist, and incidentally, he, his book, he has a book out called The Cosmic Serpent and DNA. And in 1992, he attended a conference, a conference on the development and the environment. One of the prime discussions was the ecolo uh, ecological knowledge of the people of the forest. And they were talking about, you know, how these people take care of, uh, you know, the land and the ecology and all of this stuff. Everyone knew that somehow these people knew these strange things, but no one was talking about the hallucinatory origin as claimed by the people themselves. In other words, the people say their knowledge comes to them from plants, and, and, and the scientists couldn't consider such a thing. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. So this was Narby's predicament. His colleagues came up to him, and this is what he said. Uh, they said, uh, Narby, you're telling us that Indians claim they get molecularly verifiable information from hallucinations. You don't take them seriously, do you? And so what could he answer? What could you say? I mean, they're not just saying, oh, the plants uh, make me feel good, or the plants give me... They're saying they get molecularly verifiable information. In other words, what they're doing, scientists can verify the molecular structure of what they're using, and the molecular structure of the body says, hey, we can verify this is... This is they're right on. But what the scientists are having trouble with is because the people that are using this stuff and are right on are saying, the plants tell us how to do this. Because Narby says, what could I say to them? But there's nothing one can say without contradicting two fundamental principles of Western knowledge. One, hallucinations cannot be the source of information. Western knowledge considers hallucinations to be, at the best, illusion, and at the worst, morbid phenomena. Number two, plants do not communicate like human beings. Only human beings use abstract symbols like words and pictures, and plants do not relay information in the form of mental images. That's what we thought. So Narby then has his dilemma, doesn't he? On the one hand, the results of the knowledge of the people of the forest is proven. They know somehow, molecularly, the structure of these things, so they can then deal with the glands and the different parts of the body that need to be touched by this molecular stuff. And actually, the things that have come out of the forest are also used by the pharmaceutical industry in making drugs and alternative healing agents in plants and so forth. And remember that NASA calls this uh, result photosystem one, which is the greatest power on Earth and the result of green light. But on the other hand, Narby says its origin cannot be discussed scientifically because it contradicts the axioms of Western science and Western knowledge. So it's like alternative medicine. It works, but it shouldn't because it's not taught in medical school. So what are we going to do? So now Norby realizes that the subject of plants communicating with people is a dead end. I mean, you can't go into a scientific community and start talking about this, but he was really getting psyched out. And in his book, The Cosmic Serpent, DNA, he realized that to get to the bottom of the mystery that comes from the center of the Amazon forest, that he really, he really had to devote and spend a lot of his attention doing it. So he comes to an encounter with a deep question that he had to explore. And this is the question, and this is the question he put forth. What if it were true that nature does speak in symbols and signs, hidden meanings, and that the secret to understanding nature's language consists in noticing similarities in shapes and forms? What if it's true? What if nature actually places inside of us a coded message that is somehow cosmic DNA communicating with our physical DNA, and we start to know things. And this is what Narby said. It had become clear to me that these people were somehow gaining access in their visions 
to verifiable information about plant properties. In other words, they were hallucinating from these plants, and during the hallucination, they were gaining verifiable information, information that could be verified by a university or a prestigious drug firm. And they were getting it by swallowing plants. So now he's faced with a question. There was no doubt these people were getting information from somewhere. But here was his question. Was this information coming from inside the human brain as the scientific point of view would have us? Or was it coming from the outside world of plants? In other words, was there something inside of the brain that was stimulated to say, oh, this is what you have to do? Or was it actually, was the, was the information actually coming from the plant itself that was being ingested? Now, the outside world of plants, if you look at Photosystem 1, NASA calls it the greatest power on Earth. A description of the molecular code reads like an encrypted message. That's what NASA said. There's a th so, so look at the connection I'm, well, I'm trying to get you to understand here. These people are saying that by taking this stuff, they're getting a message. NASA is saying that what is in the stuff that they're taking is an encrypted message coming from green light. The people of the forest say they're getting the information from the plants themselves. And that's what NASA is confirming, that light entering into chlorophyll of all plants and the hem of humans does exactly this, angles of light, messenger particles. This really, of all the years you've been alive, of all the years you've gone to church, of all the years you've listened to people preach, you're finally coming face to face with the nature of God. How does God communicate with you? How does meditation, how does prayer, how is this communication, how can something from the outside come inside of you and communicate and do something for you? How, how could there be this messenger? Well, now it seems as though these people are stumbling on the fact that the DNA from the outside, which is an encrypted message, comes and communicates with the DNA on the inside and something changes. So in his book, The Cosmic Serpent, Narby first had to look at this scientifically. And he says, the similarity between the molecular profiles of natural hallucinogens plants I find to be consistent with that which is in the brain called serotonin. Hmm. It seemed well and truly to indicate that both the hallucinogenic plant that these people were talking about and serotonin are like keys that fit into the same lock inside of the human brain. In other words, what he's saying is that the stuff from the plants is comfortable and fits into the lock of consciousness in the same way as an actual brain substance, which is called serotonin. So he took the next step. And this is where Narby decided this is what I've got to do. He did the same thing that Carl Jung did. You remember what Carl Jung did? Carl Jung had all of these people coming who were totally whacked out. And they were seeing all of these crazy things. And he couldn't figure out what in God's name are you talking about. So he had to um, open a bottle and take it, like Dr. Hyde or Dr. Jekyll, whatever it is, and actually consume it. And they said to Dr. Jung, you are a prestigious psychoanalyst. What are you doing to yourself? He said, how in God's name am I going to understand these people if I don't experience what they're experiencing? And he did. Narby said the same thing. He was reaching a point where to understand what these people were experiencing and saying he took hallucinogenics. This is a distinguished anthropologist from Stanford University in California. And when he took them and had the experience, it led him to disagree with the scientific position that hallucinations are merely discharges of images stacked and stacked in the subconscious. I was convinced, he said, that the enormous fluorescent snakes that I had seen thanks to Ayasuka did not correspond in any way to anything that I could have dreamed of, even in my most extreme nightmares. And before you worry too much about those snakes, remember what the snake is, DNA. Mm -hmm. 
So he was reaching a point because of his knowledge and his own experiences of finding increasingly easy to suspend disbelief. And here is this prestigious anthropologist from Stanford University, great scientist, ready to consider the point of the jungle people as potentially correct, that the plants told them. So now he had to come to the point of considering the possibility that the plants communicate with people. The green light or green party entering within the human brain, bringing with it a coded message that is cosmically, scientifically, and molecularly correct. Now listen to Dr. Narby from his book, The Cosmic Serpent. He says, after all, there are all kinds of gaps and contradictions in the scientific knowledge of hallucinogens, which at first we thought were so re reliable we find out or not. Scientists do not know how these substances affect our consciousness, nor have they studied true hallucinogens in any detail. It no longer seemed unreasonable to me to consider that the information about the molecular content of plants could truly come from the plant themselves. However, I must admit, I failed to see how this could possibly work. So I want you to put this together when you consider meditation. Light entering into you via the pineal gland and touching the hema or green and providing to you an encrypted message that your DNA is capable of decoding. Let me repeat that. On the basis of Dr. Narby, on the basis of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, I am suggesting to you that in the same way that NASA has suggested to us that the light touching the chlorophyll causes this power which uh, amino acids and so forth, the DNA. And yet what Dr. Narby is talking about is the, the plants and so forth um, and the stimulation of DNA. I want you to consider light entering into you via the pineal gland in meditation, touching the hema or green inside of you and providing to you an encrypted message that your DNA is capable of decoding. And remember, Supernova 1987A, the center is green. Laser powered by flying crafts, green light. The power of herbs, the center of the spectrum, the center of the eye. So consider yourself. You're meditating. And you're sitting here and gongs are going off and you're saying, what the, you know, what's the sense of this? This is stupid. If the result, if there is such a thing going on to be from the outside, in other words, what am I saying is going to happen to you positively? Is that going to come from the outside? Or is it going to come from inside of your brain? Or a combination of both? Remember when we discussed ghosts? Some people see them. Some people don't. There may be a vibration out there. Some people pick on it, pick up on it. So it could be something from the outside, but it requires something from the inside to combine with it for this individual then to basically have a hallucination, isn't it? I'm saying something that's really not there because I picked up something from the outside. But now I, maybe I know something now. Maybe that which was from the outside that I picked up entered in, combined with the DNA, an encrypted message, I saw something, I understood something, I could tell something, I could write something about something that really wasn't there, but I picked up something from the outside. Energy which from the outside hovers in a spot, a sensitive mind picks up what was there, and voila, you have a ghost, when there is no ghost. You have what Dr. Narby is dealing with there. Something from the outside is taken in the inside, and it causes an understanding of something that these people have no right to understand. So he reaches a reasonably similar conclusion, and the conclusions are exactly what goes on in this room. So we're in good company with this laureate from Stanford University, because this is what he says. And I want, and I, and, and I think, 
I feel, I don't feel proud of this, but I feel good about a man like Dr. Narby. And, and he just wrote this. This just come out in May. Maybe I would find the answer, he says, by looking at both perspectives at the same time. One eye on science and the other on the shaman. One eye on science and the other on the Bible. One eye on science and the other on the ancient writings. And Dr. Narby says, the solution would therefore consist in posing the question differently. It wasn't a matter of asking whether the source of hallucinations is internal or external, but of considering that it might be both at the same time. I couldn't see how this would work in practice, but I liked it because it reconciled two points of view that were apparently, you know, divergent. So he continued his research and he studied the experience of anthropologist Michael Harner who went to the Amazon trying to understand their religious system. He said, you know, I want to, I'm, I'm just here to, this guy Harner said, I'm just here to, to try to understand your religious system. You know, you know, we have our religious system, Catholics, Protestants, all that. What's your religious system? And they said to Harner, if you really want to learn, then you've got to drink Ayusaka. And he did. And after several minutes, he found himself falling into the world of hallucination. He saw giant reptile creatures projecting scenes in front of his eyes, and he was shown the earth as it was eons ago before there was life. He saw an ocean and a barren land and a bright blue sky, and then black specks dropped from the sky by the hundreds and thousands and landed in front of him. There were huge, shiny black creatures and huge bodies, and they explained that they had to come to earth to escape their enemies. They created life on earth, they said, so they could hide inside the multitude of forms. And Dr. Harner said, I learned that the dragons were thus inside of all forms of life, including us. And Harner wrote in his footnotes, and he since died, in retrospect, one could say that what I saw in that vision was almost like DNA. Although, in 1961, I knew nothing of DNA. Now consider, and I'll be done here in a second, how NASA just this month, just this month, released their Green Party paper, connecting light from above and green in hema and humans and chlorophyll and plants with DNA. And just Consider how just this month Dr. Narby from Stanford University has released this paper on green and the power of green. And Dr. Narby says this, there was indeed DNA, or there is indeed DNA in the human brain as well as plants. Given that the molecule of life containing genetic information is the same for all species, DNA could thus be considered a source of information that is both external and internal. Now, because of Dr. Horner, Dr. Narby had said, this is what I've been trying to imagine. How could something from the outside enter into a human body and convey a message to the inside. Wow! It's because the DNA in the plants is comfortable with the DNA in the, but they're the same as DNA and they communicate with one another. I got it. It is possible then to bring into the inside something from the outside and set up a conversation, an intelligent conversation, which will then spin off and be a source of instruction to the person. Then if you sit in meditation and something from the outside enters containing DNA, whether it be in light or whatever, be I'm just saying, and interacts with the DNA inside of your body, 
stimulate. Don't forget, this light comes down. That, that, that chlorophyll or that hema, that doesn't, not going to work until the light comes down. So the light comes down in chlorophyll and the amino acids DNA. The light comes down in through the pineal gland, the amino acids DNA. So it takes that light to touch the green in order for the DNA to start acting and to provide the information. Getting ready to wrap this up, but there's a lot of really great stuff to come from this. But let me leave you with this. Dr. Narby continued to study Dr. Harner, and he didn't find anything more relative to DNA. However, he was intrigued by references to the dragon and the serpent. When he read Harner's visions, and he saw the dragons and the serpents, and, and Dar Narby said, this made me think of the double helix of DNA assembled in its form two entwined serpents. And it says in the Bible in 1 Kings 6, 8, in speaking of the temple and the door to the middle chamber were in the right side and went up with winding stairs. And he found a book, Dr. Narby did, called Brain, Mind, and Shamanism by Gerald Dolreichel Dameltoff. And Narby was stopped in his tracks by a drawing in that book of the human brain with a snake lodged between the two hemispheres. Then he found a picture of two intertwined snakes, like a caduceus that your doctor wears. And in this shaman book, these two serpents symbolize a female and a male, a mother and a father, water and land. In brief, they represent a concept of opposition which has to be overcome in order to achieve individual awareness. Snakes are spiraling rhythmically in a swaying motion from one side to the other. So at this point, Narby considers the hallucination of anthropologist Horner in the Peruvian Amazon, <coughs> in the jungle here. <laughs> now he's trying to figure out. Thousands of miles away in the Colombian jungle, the people are saying the same thing. It's like the Hondra monkey theory. How, 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 they couldn't communicate with one another. Both cases of reptiles in the brain, serpent-shaped boats of cosmic origin. And Narby says, pure coincidence? There was no way that they could have communicated. So the plot thickens concerning DNA. Green light, angles of light, messenger particles, angelic messengers, if you will. And then finally, and we'll leave with this, he, he, he picked up a French book called Vision, Knowledge, and Power by Jean-Pierre Chamille. And Dar Narby says, I found a celestial serpent in a drawing of the universe by a shaman. Then another shaman was quoted as saying, at the very beginning, before the birth of earth, this earth, our most distant ancestors lived on another earth. All living beings were created by twins who are the two central characters in the thoughts of the forest people. So, do you remember when we studied Mani and who spoke of God as the opposite to what we considered? And remember Mani said, the snake who talked to Eve was the good God. He wanted you to have knowledge and understanding. When Mani was asked who told him this, he said, he met an angel, and they said, what was the angel's name? And Mani said, he was called the twin. And Narby analyzes this entire concept. He sat by himself, he said, in a room, and he thought, a Western anthropologist like Horner drinks a strong dose of ahiyaskia with one people, and gains access in the middle of the 20th century to a world that informs the mythological concepts of other people and allows them to communicate with life-creating spirits of cosmic origin possibly linked to DNA. So I hope that you will continue with me in the study of Dr. Narby's work because 
this and NASA's Green Party, we are arriving at not just a connection between light and the protein in green, but we also arrive at a knowledge of the DNA connection, a combination of external and internal DNA, and the coded messages being sent, received, and decoded in new states of consciousness. It is the first thing that I have seen that gives me reason to say, I think we are on the verge of a very, very logical explanation of what happens in meditation and how receiving that light, which then touches the hema inside of us, can cause an activation of an encrypted message that has long been seated in the um, bodies of, of, of human beings, if you want, which message can then be decoded and be given to us as instruction and healing and so forth. There is no question whatsoever, and Dr. Narby, as he winds it up, that these people in the middle of the forest have received instruction from the plants who themselves had been given that instruction by green light. So, as I said last week, I encourage you to abandon the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Communist Party, and become a member of the Green Party and put a green light at your house because it is your scientists like Dr. Narby and the people at NASA who are bringing you face to face with God. And it is the very same ones who claim to know God who sit in pulpits who are driving people farther and farther away from the knowledge of the true essence of life and creation. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I was, let me tell you two things. First of all, I said, I sat there last Tuesday night at meditation and I had this experience with, let me just say I had an experience with those. And I said, you know, in this strange way of meditation, I said, you have to do something tonight. I said, I am tired of, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm running out of ideas. I don't know what, you know, you've got to do something. I said, make something happen. I, but then I said, oh, that's stupid. I mean, that's not the way it works. No hocus pocus is going to happen. So it didn't. We went home. Joan and I were home. Joan was in one room. I was in the computer room, right, right outside of where I have the computer room I was working. And, you know, where our little room is there, Joan's car was parked, you know, close to the house looking right. So I just thought to myself, you know, what a stupid thing to be asking for something special to happen. Right about five minutes after that, her car started blowing its horn and putting its lights on in the wall. <laughs> and she came running out, what's going on? And I looked out, there wasn't anybody anywhere, but this car, lights were going on and off, and it's blowing, it's going boom, boom, <laughs> boom. So I, well, I don't know. But that's the way they operate. You can't prove anything, but it is, it is true. Yeah. Yeah, that was another thing, too, when we got home. And Joe noticed it first. I mean, you know, this is the only way. We, that's why people think we're crazy out there, because it's the only way you can talk. You never get proof on it. But as we got home, and it was dark around it, except, there was a white light stripe across the green grass. Perfect. I mean, really, it was there. She saw it. I saw it. It was really there. It's never been. So anyhow, it was kind of crazy. But... What I wanted to say then was in the mail came an envelope, and I want to thank Maeve Chadwick from Jacksonville, Florida, who's been a longtime friend and helper with this work, and I want to say a special hi to her, Leonie Nelson, and all the people down in Jacksonville, because she knows that, and she puts in her, I know it's, you know, you and reading, you know, you don't really have time, but she says, please read this. And she sent me this article from this science magazine of Dr. Narby and his experience with uh, the plants and, and the green and, and, and the people of the forest. So I am very grateful for that, and I'm you know, grateful that I, I stopped to uh, spend some time with it. Okay, we'll see you, and we'll continue with...